Hey everybody, Dr. Rick coming at you from the H uh, with another segment of the Black Voice where we probe the multitudinous melanated issues or the issues that plague my melanated people. Uh, we explore it from the belly of scientific research, which has been the brunt of my work for over 30 years. Uh, but we also explore it from wisdom, experience, historical context, uh, cultural influence, and so many other ways that impact how we move as a people. Uh, I want to tap into this surge of focus from 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 a vast variety of different uh, spaces on the WNBA, primarily around Caitlin Clark and the reception that she has received from players and others who seem to be uh, hoping, wishing, cheering for her demise uh, in one way, shape, form, or fashion. And recently, uh, Chennedy Carter, uh, who happens to be a Texan from the Dallas area, uh, balls hard, plays hard, is extremely physical, hip checked Caitlin a few days ago and the hip check, put it to the floor, but anybody that has followed Caitlin, let me let me be very clear here before I get into this because I want I want to lay this out so those who don't know me understand. I am extremely pro-black, uh, but when we start to talk about things from a perspective of how things move in the world, for me in this instance, sports. I see sports as sports. Now I'm not stupid enough to believe that. Race doesn't play a role in sports. I grew up in sports. I was an athlete at every level. And so I understand how this thing works. I understand the economic layout of how uh, wealth is secured via sports. And it's not for people who look like me predominantly. For every one person that makes it, there's an entire sector of non-blacks who are eating off of the talent of blacks. And I understand that. But when I say that, uh, as a pure fan of the sport, as a youngster, Larry Bird changed the way I viewed the game as far as, well, you know, only white, only black people can play the game. Everybody else is just alone for the ride. Um, that dude was a problem, no matter who he faced. He gave the business to everybody. And so it taught me to respect the game and not just the people. Uh, and it, I've, I've moved in a lot of different spaces, and that's that's been the case for me. I respect the game first, then I observe the people, and I put the people in the places they belong. There are some people who look like me that I don't trust, and there are some people who don't look like me who have held me down in my worst hour. But at the end of the day, I'm always going to be for my people. Now, with that being said, I don't wish ill on Caitlin Clark. I wish the truth to be the truth. If she is going to be what everybody is projecting her to be, she's got work to do. And every person that's come into any league has been challenged. You've got some greats that came and made immediate impacts, but they still had learning curves. Now, one or two things is going to happen to Caitlin. Then I'm going to get to this whole thing and how race does actually uh, a line in this there's one or two things that's going to happen with Caitlyn Caitlyn is either going to have a heart of a champion and she's going to come back next year with a, uh, some more stuff in her bag uh, a little bit stronger and a little bit wiser and hopefully a little bit more emotionally mature in the sense of how to understand that there are other people in that locker room because one of the things I noticed in every time that she takes a hard foul and this hip check by Tennedy Carter was not her first one uh, she goes to the floor hard her teammates don't run to grab her there's a reason for that and nobody's talking about that that tells me there's a problem in the locker room or that tells me that the coach hasn't galvanized the locker room and created a team first environment and so they see her as an outsider. And if you're seen as an outsider in your own locker room, you're going to catch hell because you have no insulation. Everybody can take shots at you and your teammates are just looking, yeah, whatever. They play with you because they have to. The last thing you want to, you're hearing that a lot about Russell Wilson. 
Steve, I mean, uh, Pete Carroll was the quarterback whisperer. He's one of the greatest minds, not just on X's and O's, but the managing, the management of personalities and getting the most out of people. And when Russell left Seattle, and I'm not saying he's not a capable person, I'm saying that the, ru the rumors floated around long before he left Seattle that he was not a locker room guy. He didn't hang out with the guys. He didn't talk to the guys after they left the field. He was very to himself. You know, and that may that may work in corporate America. It does not work when you're building a team because the team is almost like a family. They've got to trust you. And if you don't have nothing to do with them outside of that locker room, it's going to be hard to have cohesiveness inside the locker room. With that being said, that's that part of it. Now, here's where the race part actually comes in. Unfortunately for Caitlin, I actually think she's just a girl who wants to play ball. And she took a lot on her shoulders because she has a unique skill set. She can stroke the ball. She's a decent ball handler. She's not an excellent or great ball handler. Uh, she's a nice passer. She finds the open person. She's very good at outletting and catching people rolling to the hole. She's very good at it. Um, and, and she'll get better if she sticks around. And I'm not saying that facetiously. I'm saying she's got to have the heart of a champion. She has the heart of a champion. She's going to let the knocks and bruises make her. And if she's made, she's already got the base skill set to do something special. Or she's going to break under the pressure that everybody's putting on her, trying to make her be something she's not yet. Great shooter. Nobody's going to take that away from her. The best player, I don't, Rakia Jackson to me is the best player that came out in the draft. Uh, but let's talk about the racial dynamic here. Everybody is trying to make it seem like Caitlin Clark showed up from uh, some planet, some far, well, far out of space, and just landed on planet Earth and for four years set college basketball on fire and the world was just excited. She did some pretty extraordinary things at Iowa and nobody knew who she was. Unless you were an Iowa fan or you were dealing with Big Ten or whatever, I was, I think I was in the Big Ten. Yeah, in the Big Ten. Unless you were dealing with the Big Ten, you didn't know who she was. And I actually keep up with women who, and I knew of her, but nobody was checking her. She wasn't getting a whole lot of TV time. She wasn't in a big market. Caitlin's meteoric rise came as a result of not just her beef with Angel, but her beef with South Carolina before they played LSU. She had she she had a historic run during the tournament. She was balling, averaging 30 plus points a game. People were starting to talk, but they were also talking about Angel Reese, the Bayou Barbie. They were talking about that. And that is uh, like what really and truly uh, started the little buzz, but it was when she, it was when she, uh, I don't want to hit nobody's stuff. It's when she can't see me, you know, the face thing to the kids at South Carolina after, the, you know, they, they beat the champs. And you know, she's excited and she did what she did. And the thing is she took, when it came back on her, she took it. She said, hey, it is what it is, it's a sport. You wanna talk, you gotta be prepared to talk to. She said that. She came back out and said she had no problem with what Angel Reese did. Obviously she didn't like it in the moment, but she said, hey, when you put it out there, you gotta be able to expect it to come back. That was her thing. I can respect that. Uh, but let's be very clear here. In order to have a hero, you have to have a nemesis. You have to have a villain. Angel Reese is the antithesis of the quintessential white girl. Let's just call it what it is. I'm not saying that being a quintessential white girl is a bad thing when you're a quintessential white girl. I'm saying that from a young uh, black girl from Baltimore who had to go get it and had, you know, to do all the things that her mom had to do to get her into those type of programs that uh, showcased her skills to get her opportunities to go to, uh, where was she at? Was she at Maryland? 
before she transferred to LSU, she was somewhere over there near where she where she's from. And anyway, uh, she uh, had to do that, but she was a representation of what little black girls could understand and 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 and, and, and relate to. And the crazy thing is, there were a lot of black people that wanted to tone her down, that wanted to make, and I'm not an eyelash person, anybody tell you, I can't stand them damn eyelashes, but I understand who she is and she's being her, and I'm not anywhere close to her age, so I ain't never ever gotta be thinking about dating her or anybody else, you know, that's coming out of that thing, so that's that's not an issue, but th that that's me and where I'm at and my thing, but, what I do recognize is she went back to the school that she came from. She gave scholarships to the girls who would have not been able to play at that school. She's given, she's done a lot of different things. And she's a 22 year old, she's made a few mistakes. But at the end of the day, she shows up and she plays hard. She plays with her heart and she plays. And when she took her heart foul, they asked her at the count, at the, at, at the interview desk, you know, how does she feel about it? She said, hey, it's, it's, it's basketball. You know, I'm going to be okay. I'm good, guys. That's her response. And, uh, okay, so that's what I'm expecting. You can dish it because she definitely dishes it. You have to be willing to take it. Now, what people don't talk about is when it comes to that file by Kennedy Carter, that four trips down the court previous to that, she's getting hand-checked, freehand, pushed off, uh, pushed down. I mean, Caitlin Clark, number one, is not a rookie and she's not a softie in the sense that she's just some little frail little girl running around the court. She grew up in an area of Indiana, French League or whatever it is, Indiana, where what no girls to play basketball. She played with boys. And so she's not frail, but she will play the victim card. She'll flop and she'll look up and she'll go, oh my God, what's going on? And, and she'll get the call. That hip check was a hip check and that hip check was to say, I'm here. And that's basketball. I watched a clip before I did this of six minutes straight of WNBA basketball before Caitlin Clark. And them girls are bringing the pain. They are playing physical. They are scrapping. They bucking. They fighting. They punching. They pushing. They slamming. And this is before Caitlyn got there. To think that Caitlyn's gonna walk into that and everybody's going to part the Red Sea and just open up and say, well, the great savior is here. No, just like every other great player that put their stamp on the ball, if you're that great, you're gonna have to go through it and you're gonna have to prove yourself and they're gonna test you. They put Jordan on the paint constantly until he got in the gym. He hired Tim Grover, got in the gym, got his head right, and t kept attacking the paint, knowing that they were going to try to put him on the floor. And he just got to the point where it didn't matter anymore. That's greatness. Same thing with Kobe. You could say the same thing with LeBron in the sense of just having his body right, just having everybody talk about what he can't do, what he can't do, and just keep playing and just keep playing, and eventually you get it. He ain't going to do this. He ain't going to do it. You get it. And all of this, and there are those players, and there are dogs out there, you know, that name, I can't possibly mention all of them, that got out there and did it. But as you're talking about, if you're talking about great greats, they show up. And they show up and they win and they go through something. No, I don't know anything where a freshman or a rookie comes in and don't, don't get the business. And they expect it to happen with her. But let me be very clear. It was the black and the white polarization that created this. Her, her following is predominantly white. Angel Reese's uh, following is predominantly black. And they played off of that. They built momentum. They created something in in a space in time where it was only going to exist for a moment their clash in the finals and uh then the clash the next year that right there is not going to happen very often you have two uh polarizing individuals that definitely represent two different demographics and they played them against one another, which has been done constantly. Ali, play, I mean, you can go on down the line. Tiger, you can go on down the line. Venus and Serena, you can go on. 
those people took in went into sports and get you know basically polarized and then ultimately galvanized the sport it's still to be determined what this young lady is going to do angel is playing well you know to uh, all things considered Caitlin has some up games some down games you know she she's either going to get it or she isn't i'm not wishing anything on her i want every person to be the best but what i'm gonna tell you is you got to understand who's eating at the top and who's controlling the narrative while everybody's down here bickering about it everybody's going at it from even stephen a smith and monica mcnutt all of them going at it talking all this stuff and the people who are eating are the people that are either the six powerful men who own all of the media in the world or someone very closely related and connected to them. And obviously the sports teams that are benefited from it and their ownership. So look, we've got to do a better job of understanding things, but this whole idea that Caitlin just showed up, you know, uh, to the great metropolis and and, and, and was superwoman or whatever. And it was a lot that went into the creation of that brand and the creation of that push. And this isn't to take anything away from her game. Uh, I appreciate her game. Uh, and if she adds her, more into her repertoire and her bag, she can do some things. Uh, but she's learning right now that you, you just went from a place where you were the best person on your team to, you know, and one of the best in the country to being with playing in a league where everybody was that person at some level or some way. And then you got heat on your tail because in another three years, you got three kids that were freshmen last year that all are capable of surpassing you. This is what she has to look at. This is the life of being an athlete. It's always somebody coming from the throne and it's always someone sitting on it. And you have to determine where you're at and what you're going to do in reference to that and then do it. And you got to know that that's what you wake up every day and do. You either, um, uh, as Eric Thomas say, you either the lion or the gazelle, but either way, you better wake up every morning running. And on that note, look, I'm going to get out of here. You guys have an unbelievable remainder of your day.